The parables of Jesus are some of the most important teachings in the Bible. Rich, rich teaching. The parable of the soil. So Jesus decided to tell us. You know, our Lord gives many parables. So let's listen carefully and prayerfully and reverently. If you want to turn to Luke chapter 15, we are going to finish up um, this series of parables that Jesus has started concerning the lost and the found. Um, those of you that are taking notes tonight is going to be a little different. Um, there's notes to be taken and there's a few things that will show up on the screen, but primarily tonight is going to be you getting involved in the story. You getting involved in the narrative of Jesus trying to convey something at the end of this series of three parables. So I probably will ask you questions because I can't talk without asking questions. That's just part of who I am. So you will hear questions come out of my mouth. But you will notice there are no questions that are going to show up on the screen. This is a time for you to get involved in the story. And as you get involved in the story, you ask the Spirit of God, what part of this story do you need to reflect upon? What part of your life do you need to ask questions about? How do you get to know Jesus in a way that Jesus wants you to get to know him? I already started with four questions, right? <laughs> So, as you move in that direction, please allow this evening to move you into the narrative. If you are taking notes, uh, the title of tonight is Right or Wrong, Jesus is Essential. Right or Wrong, Jesus is Essential. Luke chapter 15, I'm going to read starting in verse 1, and I'm going to read all the way through the entire chapter, verse 32. We've already gone through verses 1 through 10, and so verse 11 will start the quote-unquote new material, but I want you to get into the mindset of Jesus addressing the crowd that has been gathered. A crowd has gathered, a question has been thrown Jesus' way, and here is Jesus responding to whom has been gathered. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost just so. I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods and that pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. 
I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But, I, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. As you begin to intake the narrative and as you begin to put pieces of the puzzle together, even in your own mind, if you grew up in church, you probably already have a a framework to begin to think about the terminology of prodigal. If, if you didn't grow up in church and that's not your background, you may already have an understanding because you're a word type of person of what prodigal means. But really, for lots of years, the church has got it wrong. Because when we say prodigal, we immediately think of the younger brother. We immediately think of the brother who went and wasted things away. And so what we think when we say prodigal, and in fact, we talk about the parable being labeled the prodigal son, we think about the wayward son. We think about the son that just lost everything and, and destroyed his life. But I love to go back to what does prodigal really mean? This is what it means. Prodigal means wastefully or recklessly extravagant, and maybe you could say that this younger brother was reckless and he uh, wasted away certain things. But as you begin to think about the word extravagant, then it moves you to the second definition of prodigal, which means giving or yielding profusely. Or the third description of prodigal lavishly abundant. It puts a different spin on the idea of prodigal. It gets us to understand, well, wait a second. What is prodigal describing? Could it be that this moment that Jesus takes is describing something bigger than just the younger brother? Could it be that Jesus is describing God himself as someone who is giving or yielding profusely, someone who is lavishly abundant? You see, if you enjoy story and I enjoy story, if you enjoy drama and I enjoy drama, I know that, you know, Downton has just started, um, if you don't know the right website, because I've already watched it all, or if you um, want to watch Sherlock and, you know, Sherlock is this dramatic, wonderful, awesome writing, and all of these are British TV. I don't know why British TV is all the rage these days, but it is. And, and so we like a good story. We like to be caught up in some something dramatic. And so if we're looking at this as a play that you have just shown up to watch, you immediately say, well, who are the characters? And in this story, there are simply three. There's the father, there's the younger brother, and there's the older brother. 
Jesus is telling a story, and we must ask ourselves the question, with any good storyteller, they know who they're telling the story to. They know their audience. And so we ask immediately, here are the characters, and Jesus is telling the story, and so who is the audience that Jesus is trying to convey these ideas to? And we've already answered this question last week, and we read it again this week. We understand that there are both types of people that have gathered around Jesus. Verse 1 says that now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near him. And then it says the Pharisees and the scribes were also there and they were grumbling saying, look at this guy, he eats with sinners. He invites them to be part of his life. And so the audience that Jesus is speaking to could be described as people who would be fit into the younger brother category, those sinners, those wasters of their lives, as you would maybe describe it in the biblical narrative. But also there are those in the audience that Jesus is speaking to that are, in fact, representative of the older brother. You see, the parable doesn't stop at the younger brother. It takes an extended look at the older brother. And the narrative actually climaxes. It actually reaches its crescendo with a powerful plea from the father, not to the younger brother, but to the older brother to consider changing his heart. So there's this story, there's this narrative, there's these characters involved, and there's a reason that Jesus is telling the story. You see, the target of this story, even though you may have sat in church before and heard that we need to not waste our life like the younger brother, the target of this story is not so much the sinner. It's not so much the outsider. The target of this story is Jesus answering the question of the insiders. The Pharisees and scribes are grumbling, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with him. And Jesus responds to their accusations. And he responds with three parables, two of which we've already gone through, and the third, which we're going through now. And so the target of this story, guess what, is to the morally good. The target of this story is to the insiders. You see, he is speaking directly to the Pharisees, and what he's saying to them is this. He wants to unveil their blindness, their narrowness, their self-righteousness. Their souls are isolated within themselves without access to God or to others. Jesus is telling a story to get the insiders, to get the morally good to wake up and to think about something outside outside of themselves. You see, even maybe now you're sitting here going, this is not what I've heard before. Maybe now you're trying to wrestle with, wait a second, what is this about? And if you know anything about God, if you want to be curious about this person, Jesus, then what you learn about Jesus is he quickly shatters the categories that we have constructed about who, in fact, he is. And so maybe this evening, what you need to allow yourself to do is just deconstruct what you had originally thought about this story, or maybe you had no thoughts, and so now it's time for you to hear about Jesus from the beginning. Who is this person? What is he about? Is what he stand for, stands for worth me devoting my life towards? As you think about this story, I want you to think about these categories. Jesus shatters our categories. May the right wing and left wing, conservative, liberal, free spirit, responsible, reckless, diligent wars begin. 
We live in a cultural war, and in that war there are two sides, and the question becomes, well, whose side is Jesus on? Is he on the good guy side, the morally good, the guys that keep the rules, or is he on the bad guy side, the sinners, the people that screw up their lives all the time? Whose side is Jesus on? There's a great quote. My kids right now, um, Morgan and Kara, and Kara is more excited about it than Morgan, have just recently, the, the world um, of Middle Earth has just opened up to them in, in Lord of the Rings. And so Kyle, as an older, responsible, wonderful brother, just couldn't wait to enlighten them into the world um, of Lord of the Rings. And so uh, again, Kara is more excited than Morgan about it. Morgan just says there's just too much killing, right? And, well, she's right. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of killing that happens in Lord of the Rings, and Kara, for some reason, likes it. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, but as you think about Lord of the Rings, there's this great quote, and it's when the hobbits are asking the ancient tree beard whose side he is on. And as the tree beard answers the hobbits, this is what he says, and I wish I could have a good tree beard voice. I don't. I'm not altogether on anybody's side because nobody is altogether on my side. But there are some things, of course, whose side I'm altogether not on. Right? <laughs> We're in the drama, right? We're ready. As you think about Jesus, whose side is he on? Jesus is not on the side of the irreligious or the religious. But he singles out religious moralism in this particular parable as a particularly deadly spiritual condition. The focus of this story, the focus of this narrative really moves us to understand what is Jesus saying about the morally good. It's really interesting as you look at the cultural wars that Christianity has so throughout thousands of years all of a sudden been categorized as a religion. It didn't start that way. Christianity was not a religion. Christianity was a way of life. It was a radical way of life. In fact, it was so radical that the Romans called Christians atheists. That was the word that Romans would use to describe Christianity because it did not fit in any religious realm of what the people of that day existed. And so when you think about how have we come this far that this radical approach to knowing God and to understanding his kingdom and to living a life, loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as itself, how somehow has that turned into a cultural war that says, I want nothing to do with the religion of Christianity? What has changed? What has moved? What's been the explanation that has so captivated churches for centuries. There's two acts to the story, Act 1, Act 2. Act 1 involves the younger brother, Act 2 involves the older brother. Both are present. We need to talk about both, so let's look at the younger brother's perspective for just one moment. On the cultural war side of things, if you were paying attention, he's the left-wing, liberal, free spirit, reckless one. He stands on that side of the pendulum. And as you begin to think about him in his free-spiritedness, he says to his father, I want what is mine. And I want you, as my dad, to be out of the control of my life. As you think about the story and you begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together, this younger son, the younger brother, approaches his dad and says, I need my inheritance. I want it. I'm out of here. I'm tired of being under the rules of your house. Now, those people listening, remember the audience. Remember, we are in first century 
Middle Eastern Palestinian thought. We are in the middle of dusty roads and busy towns and all kinds of things that are happening. And Jesus is speaking into a very specific culture. And so you're going to have to tap into your Jewishness and, and try to figure out what is happening as Jesus is speaking to these people. And if Jesus was speaking to people and they heard a young son disrespecting his Middle Eastern father in such a way, what they expect the story to end up is for the father to simply backhand the son. Because you don't treat your father in a patriarchal society that way. But that's not how the father responds. We begin to learn about the character of this father even in his response to his younger son. What we learn is it talks about property. Notice it doesn't talk about money initially. It says he wants his property, which means that everything back in this system of wealth, even if you were a wealthy person, your wealth was tied up in land. You had a lot of land. You had an ability to produce a crop. You had an ability to hire a lot of people. Your wealth was tied up in your land. And so in the American cultural mindset, remember, you've got to change that. You've got to move away from that. The, the dad didn't just go to Chase Bank and withdraw, you know, one third of his inheritance and say, here you go. That's not what happened. The dad had to go through a process of giving the son what the son would have gotten had the dad died. And so as you think about this posture that the dad is giving this younger son, what he's saying is your inheritance is tied to the land, and normally it would work like this. If dad dies, then the older son would get two-thirds of everything that the dad had, and the younger would get one-third. So consider the sacrifice of the father as he walks away from his son demanding his inheritance and he doesn't backhand him, but he actually goes into a considerable moment of sacrifice. His life would be torn apart. Not only would he lose his wealth, he would lose his honor, and ultimately he would lose his son. What would the community think? This is a wealthy pillar of the community. This is a place that people watch. This is what society is wanting their life to be. If only we could be as well off as that family, and yet they watch this family, and they watch the younger son tear it apart by saying, I want what is due me. Give it to me now. And the father gives it to him. So the younger son goes away. He cashes in on his land and he goes to whatever city of extraordinary lusciousness that you want to explain. If it was the Old West, it would have been Tombstone. If it's currently, it's Las Vegas. It's wherever you can do whatever your heart desires. That's where this son goes and he wastes whatever money he has. And as he wastes whatever money he has, he then finds himself not quite at the end of the rope until a famine hits the land, and he's desperate. This is a Jewish person, desperate, and he ends up working with pigs. Notice the desperateness of where he finds himself. And as he is working among the pigs, he is so hungry because of the famine that what the owner of the pigs is feeding the pigs, he's wishing he could eat. That's where he finds himself. And in the middle of him finding himself there, he awakens to the reality, you know what? I would be better off if I was one of my father's hired hands. And so he begins this reflection of his life, begins to realize the error of his ways, and begins in the middle of a pig pen to decide that he's going to go back to his dad. And he knows the dishonor that he has given his dad. He, know the, he knows the life that he has torn apart from his dad, and so he is not going to return to his dad and say, please reinstate me as your son. He's not even going to return to his dad and say, please reinstate me as one of your servants. 
but reinstate me or just give me something as a hired hand. You see, servants were part of the property. They, they lived there and they ate there and they had a pretty decent life. Hired hands were very temporary work. And so he didn't even want to come back into his father's house as someone who would be there for a long time. He just asked his dad, could I possibly just be one of the hired men? And so he has this plan. He has this speech prepared. He's ready to go and to grovel, not because he expects his dad to do anything. He just wants a good meal to eat. And so he makes the journey home. And the narrative continues. As he makes the journey home, we notice the father's response. Starting in verse um, uh, 20. And he arose and came to his father. But, he, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. His father was waiting. His father was watching. His father was still yearning for his son to return. And as soon as he sees him, as soon as he looks out in the distance and he thinks, you know what, I think that might be him, he runs recklessly, lavishly, abandoning all uh, properness of his culture and runs out to meet his son. Again, put yourself in the Middle Eastern mindset. Patriarchs did not run. Children ran. Women ran. Young men ran. But patriarchal men would never expose their legs as they lifted their robe and run. It is a cultural faux pas. You would not do that. This father did not care. He ran to his son with great extravagance. The first message that we find in this reality of this parable and this character that we know that this father is being described as God in this story, God's love and forgiveness can pardon and restore any and every kind of sin or wrongdoing. It doesn't matter what you are or what you've done. Grace abundant. The first message that we find is we are still in the middle, at the, almost towards the end of Act 1. The son has returned. The father runs to approach the son, doesn't let the son even get an apology out, doesn't let the son even negotiate, let me be one of your hired men. He immediately says, send out to the servants, bring me my robe, bring me my ring, bring me the shoes, reinstate my son. This is time for a celebration. Grace Abundant. There is no evil that the Father's love cannot pardon and cover. There is no sin that is a match for the Father's grace. God the Father runs to every sinner, opens up his arms, and says, welcome home. You see, the first message that we find in this description is God's grace can be described as prodigal. If you look at the definition of God's grace, recklessly extravagant, giving profusely, lavishly abundant. If the end of Act 1, we rest in the reality that shows the freeness of God's grace, then the Act two starts, You've, the house lights have come on, the actors are going off the stage, they're going to the bathroom and getting a drink, and so are you, and then the lights flash again, and it's time to come back to act two, and as act two starts, we realize that if act one shows the freeness of God's grace, then act two will show us the costliness of that grace. 
Act 2 will show us the actual climax of the story. And so as you get settled in for Act 2, it's now time for the older brother's part in the story. In the same way that the younger brother disgraced his father, well, guess what? The older brother disgraces his father. The older brother is out in the field, and he hears music, and he smells the fun of joyous festival activity. And so he calls a servant, and he says, hey, what's going on? And he said, haven't you heard? Your younger brother is back, and your dad is throwing this huge celebration. And the older <clears throat> son says, what? Dad, what are you doing? You've brought him back? What are you thinking? Look what he has cost this family. And now he's going to cost us even more because you've reinstated him. You've made him part of this family. He's already took a third, and now you're going to give him another third. That means I get less. I've been here the whole time. What are you doing? Why would you do this, Dad? You haven't even given me so much as a goat. I have worked and worked and earned what I've got. My brother has done nothing. I have never disobeyed you. Dad, I have rights. That is what this older son declares to his father. What are you thinking? And as we hear that resounding and echoing off the walls of this exchange between the father and the older son, message number two becomes clear. God's love isn't merited fury. The father, again, unlike the Middle Eastern standard of just backhanding the disrespect that this older son has shown him in the middle of this festival, in the middle of this celebration, in the middle of this great joy, and now all of a sudden you're turning this and making it all about you. Instead of an immediate reprimand, what the father does is extend more grace. It's a simple invitation to join the family celebration. I'm not going to disown your brother. But I don't want to disown you either. Swallow your pride. And come to the feast. Grace abundant. We have the first message to the younger brother. And we have the second message to the older brother. And if you are in the crowd, if you would be classified as a sinner or you would be classified as the religious moral good, here you are. You're sitting on the edge of your seat. You're waiting to hear Jesus' end of this story. You're ready for him to bring it all in and tie it all up and make it neat and pretty and American television, not British television, right? It's, it's that kind of thing. I'm ready to hear how you're going to make this be good and how this older son is going to actually come out good on the end. Will the family finally be reunited in unity and love? Will the brothers be reconciled? Will the older brother soften his heart and be reconciled to his father? But what happens? Verse 31. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead, and he's alive. He was lost, and now he's found. The story ends. There's no neatly tied up great conclusion. Jesus is redefining everything we thought we knew about connecting to God. He's redefining sin and lostness. 
He's redefining what does it mean to be saved? How do we find salvation if God doesn't allow moral conformity to be the standard or sinful rebellion to be the standard? As we wrestle with the end of the story, Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus wanted us to look at the whole narrative of what soon would be, when we're on this end of things, what soon would be scripture to understand what is Jesus' point. You see, in life, in culture, in our experience, there's two basic ways that we attempt to find happiness and fulfillment. As you think about your life and you think about how you manage through life and you think about how you make decisions and what your motivations are to make decisions, you either fall in category number one, which is moral conformity. You put the will of God and the standards of the community ahead of your own individual fulfillment. And what you think to yourself and what you say to people, depending on your personality, the world would be a better place if people would simply achieve moral rectitude. If people would live differently, if people would change how they live, if people would change according to the standards that you declare, then the world would be a better place. If you don't fall in that category, then you fall oftentimes in the second basic way in which we attempt to find happiness and fulfillment, and that is in the way of self-discovery. And in this way, you have freedom to pursue goals. You have freedom to move towards self-actualization regardless of custom and convention. The world would be a far better place if tradition and prejudice and hierarchical authority and other barriers, barriers to personal freedom were weakened or removed. What's wrong with the world is there's too many people telling other people what to do. If we could all just live our lives and you'd leave me alone, then the world would be a better place. By the audience's standards, those who are listening to Jesus' message, and even by our standards, one is bad and one is good. Is it the older brother or is it the younger brother? But the, at the end of the story, the older brother is the one that is deliberately left in this state of alienation. You see, the bad son enters into the father's feast, but the good son doesn't. And as we look at this story and as we wrestle with this narrative, what begins to pound at our hearts, what begins to open us up to all sorts of questions is we continue to hear the good son say, I have done everything you asked. I have never disobeyed your commands. It is not his wrongdoing, but his righteousness that is keeping him from sharing the feast of the Father. Allow that to sit. Allow that to shake your worldview just for a little bit. Hearts on both ends of the spectrum are more similar than we think. Both sons resented their father's authority and sought ways of getting out from under it. Neither son loved the father for himself. They both were using the father for their own self-centered ends rather than loving, enjoying, and serving him for his own sake. As you begin to wrestle with 
who you are and where you are and maybe you're not as black and white. Maybe you gravitate to one but then you find yourself in the other. And Maybe you move to one and you don't see that that's working out too well for you so you go to the other and then you realize, well, that's not the greatest either. And so you just kind of swing back and forth between the two. But what is Jesus saying to the condition of our heart? And as he leaves the good son in the lurch as the one not enjoying the feast, then we have to begin to question moral conformity. You see, sometimes by avoiding sin, you have successfully avoided Jesus. What does that mean? How do you wrap your brain around that? You see, you don't need his grace because you are desperately trying to be your own savior. Often, this is what happens when someone who's in the number one camp, the moral conformity camp, doesn't get their way. When life doesn't go as you want, you're angry and bitter. I mean, go back to what the son says to his dad. What are you thinking? I've been here the whole time. I deserve better. I've always obeyed you. I've done everything you've wanted me to do. Angerness and bitterness. What you often find in this reality is their self-image is based on their superiority. Wouldn't it be true that we think that the, the older brother thinks he's better than the younger brother? Man, if those fools would just start acting this way, then they would have a better life. If they could just start being as moral as I am, then the world would be better. We have this superior complex. Often people in moral conformity live life out of fear, not out of joy and love. And finally, often there's a lack of assurance of the father's love. The older son is somehow trying to earn the affections of his dad. I'm here. I'm always on time. I'm always doing what you want me to do. So now I deserve your blessing. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. We've read this before in the first two parables as we're beginning to make sense of the lost and found. For the Son of Man, speaking of Jesus, came to seek and to save the lost. As you begin to wrap your mind around the good and the bad and this pendulum that's swinging back and forth and message number one and message number two, I think the question that does come to mind, and it's a simple question, it's, well, what do we need? Whether we're the younger son or the older son, at the end of the day, what can we expect from God? What do we need from a Savior? And the story, the narrative, is not absent of what we need. The first thing that we find is we need God's lavish love. Who takes the initiative? The father, both times, takes the initiative. Sees the younger son out in the field and runs with reckless abandon to wrap his arms around the younger son. He takes the initiative to find him and to place his robe on him and to bring him back into the family. The son can do nothing to earn the father's favor and the favor immediately reinstates him as his son. It's no different with the older son. The older son is obviously, visibly irate and the father does what? Doesn't just leave him, leave him in his room to pout and to sulk. What a selfish individual. No, the father goes and approaches the son and says, hey, I understand some of the things that you're feeling, but you are mine. 
come celebrate God's lavish love. Whether you are openly rebellious or you're steeped in moral goodness, we need the initiating grace of God. Here's my first quasi question. Are you experiencing the initiating grace of God? The second thing that we need, the second thing that we learn from this story is not only do we see God's lavish love, but we also see a deep gospel repentance. But it's interesting who shows up with the repentance. It's the younger, rebellious, morally corrupt one. The younger son quickly discovers that his only hope is found in his father. Our only hope is found in God. The answer for badness is not goodness. As Jesus is trying to speak to his audience, which are filled with Pharisees and sinners, what he's saying to both camps is the answer to badness is not goodness. As you look to what the gospel repentance is, it's not about restitution or rightness. So God's lavish love and a posture of repentance and an understanding that the gospel is God taking the initiative, God reaching out to us, us understanding this story that has been woven throughout creation and throughout history and throughout scripture and parable number one, right? The sheep is lost, 99 remain, but one wanders off. And so the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes and searches for the one. Parable number two, guess what? The search is on. The coin has been dropped in the dust and the woman needs that coin. It's part of her livelihood. And so she lights a lamp and she starts to sweep the floor. The search is on. She drops everything and looks to discover what is happening. How can I discover that coin? And then we get to parable number three. And if we have been listening, we quickly realize, wait, the son was lost and nobody went searching for him. What? No one desperately went searching for the sun. Number one, the search is on. Number two, the search is on. Number three, no one. Mercy and forgiveness must be free. If the wrongdoer has to do something to merit, merit it, then it isn't mercy. So the first son experiences mercy and forgiveness, and mercy is free. We cannot earn our way to heaven. We cannot live up to the standard that God has set. We cannot do it. We are morally corrupt, no matter how morally good we think that we are. But forgiveness always comes at a cost. Mercy is free, but forgiveness comes at a cost to the one who's granting the forgiveness. So let's put the pieces of this puzzle together. Act one, if you want to summarize it, how free the Father's forgiveness is. Act two, we begin to realize the insight into what forgiveness costs. You see, the younger brother's restoration was free to him. But it came at an enormous cost to who? The older brother. As you begin to look at this story, the father could not reinstate the younger except at the expense of the older brother. There was no other way to do it. If you look at the way the system is built, inheritances happen the way inheritances happen. 
The younger brother already took his inheritance. Now he's come back. The son, the father has extended extreme amount of mercy on him. But more than mercy, he gives him complete forgiveness. He reinstates him as the son. Well, guess not what? The father is only worth this much when he used to be worth this much. Now when the father dies, there's complete right to the inheritance again. Who gets more money? The younger son. Who gets less money? The older son. You see, forgiveness costs something. There's no other way. But you see, a true, worthy, older brother is absent of the story. The older brother that's represented in this story is not willing to pay any cost to seek and to save that which is lost. The younger son gets a Pharisee for a brother. but we don't. We don't get a Pharisee. When the Father looks at his creation, whether we are sinfully rebellious or morally conformed, what the Father sends us is the son, the older brother, who is willing to seek and to save that which is lost. The story is absent of the good older brother. On the cross, Jesus was treated as an outcast so that we could be brought into God's family freely by grace. Philippians chapter 2 verses 4 through 11 says this, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Here's the description. Here is Jesus speaking to his audience. This is what Paul is trying to get us to understand about the reality of the character of Christ. Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Jesus drank the cup of eternal justice so that we could have the cup of the Father's joy. What if Jesus showed up at the Garden of Gethsemane and he began to pour out his concern? And as he said to his Father in heaven, are you sure? And as the stress and as the depth of the weight of what Jesus was about to enter into with the crucifixion and with his death and with taking on the sin, how would it have turned out? if Jesus would have acted like the older brother in the third parable. Who do you think you are? Do you know who I am? I've done everything you have commanded me. And you want what? It's not Jesus' response. Jesus says to his father, are you sure this is the only way? Are you sure it's going to cost me this much? Are you sure? And he hears yes. And he hears. And then he says to his dad, your will be done. That's the type of brother that we have in Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20 says this. All this is from God 
who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. This makes so much more sense when you put it in line with this third parable. You don't even have to really define reconciliation because we've just been entrapped by the whole idea of reconciliation. So as you live and breathe and eat this passage, you begin to understand that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and not entrusting to us the message, excuse me, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Timothy Keller says this about this topic. Jesus doesn't love us because we are beautiful. We become beautiful through Jesus' sacrificial love. My prayer is that we as the church would experience God not because of religion, not because of do's and don'ts, not because of we've just come out of something horrible, but that we would experience and know and understand God because of Jesus. That he is our example to live and to breathe that as he lived his life, we would come underneath that and that our ministry, that our purpose, that our strategy, that our mission would be to be part of the process of reconciliation. That when people walk through these doors or walk into your homes as a result of community groups, they would not feel judgment. They would not feel like, oh my gosh, they're so good and I'm so bad. But what they would feel is the grace the overwhelming grace of Jesus. And as they feel that grace, we would all be able to lift our eyes and our hands and raise them to heaven and say, because of Jesus, we have hope. There's no other way. Only through Jesus.